Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And as a member representing uh, a constituency in Aberdeen, uh, clearly today's debate uh, is of extreme importance to the area I represent uh, and to my constituents, many of whom are facing an uncertain future as a result of the oil price downturn. And I think one of the, the challenges that is always faced uh, in politics is to address the seriousness of the issue while at the same time avoiding talking uh, the future prospects of the industry down because we've seen uh, a number of commentators speak uh, of the fact that there is still a long-term future in terms of both uh, exploration and production. It's a question of how the industry is supported during the current period, not a question of casting it adrift. And I think that is the balancing act that needs to be performed when we discuss this. But to deal with the issue that uh, Patrick Harvey and the Greens uh, have brought to the Chamber today around the transition, because to listen to what is being said and to some of the commentary previously, it would, it would be easy to assume that support for renewables is not in place, that there is not work being done and leadership being shown by the Scottish Government in relation to renewables. But if we look at the briefing sent to members by Scottish renewables themselves, they speak of the leadership of the Scottish Government and cross-party political support, setting strong objectives to the renewable sector, leading to thousands of jobs and attracting finance from across the globe. Uh, perhaps in just a second, Mr Harvey. It talks uh, of uh, renewables now being our largest generator of power, uh, renewable heat quadrupling from 2009 to 2014. So that, to me, demonstrates a strong performance in relation to renewables. Indeed, renewables overtook nuclear uh, in 2014 as Scotland's single largest source of electricity. Uh, we also, uh, in September uh, of 2015, reached the target for 500 megawatts of community and local owned renewables. That was a target that was set for 2020, not 2015. So that target was hit five years early. So there is leadership, there is support, and the work is being done to ensure the renewable sector can thrive. But there are impediments in place, which I'll come to after I take Mr Harvey's intervention. I'm grateful to Harvey. Mr Macdonald for giving way. And I welcome the progress that's been made on renewable electricity, much less progress so far on renewable in the rest of the energy system. But it is clear that generating more renewable electricity in itself doesn't cut emissions unless it displaces fossil fuels. And if we continue to extract those fossil fuels, then whether they end up being used in Scotland anywhere or anywhere else, the fossil carbon ends up in the atmosphere. See, the, the, this is where I take, this is where Mr Harvey and I depart, uh, is when he creates the either or situation that he, that he is seeking to create here. We have to have uh, appropriate management of our resources uh, because we will require those hydrocarbons uh, in the near future. We cannot simply uh, get to that stage uh, that Mr Harvey seeks to get to uh, by simply switching off support and allowing the industry to decline further. Uh, what, what I will say is that there are impediments in place in relation to renewables and the Scottish Renewables Briefing goes into some detail of those. They exist in terms of the policy changes that are taking effect at a Westminster level in relation to the energy policy approaches that are being taken there, which are making it harder for renewable companies to invest, to attract finance and to operate. Those are the changes that need to be made uh, and need to be affected if we want to see that support, that welcome support for the renewable sector continue to increase in Scotland. There's another point here around the oil and gas sector and where support uh, is required. And I heard uh, the comments that Murdo Fraser made around there not being support around further tax uh, issues, uh, to further tax changes. Uh, it's quite clear uh, that there is a requirement for tax changes in relation to exploration, to try and stimulate and boost exploration activity. That would have two effects. Firstly, it would allow for safeguarding of jobs. It would allow for the... Uh, activity to increase uh, and also uh, for support uh, to go into the supply chain. I spoke to a supply chain company in the North East recently who said that if uh, rigs were out active and exploring at present, that would be worth around £250,000 per rig 
to that company. So four exploration rigs for that company would equate to £1 million. That is a, a very uh, stark uh, contrast with the zero that they get while those rigs sit idle. So exploration activity being boosted has a direct effect, uh, not just on those individuals who are employed uh, and those companies who uh, are employed in that exploration activity, but further down the supply chain as well. There are massive benefits that could be realised uh, in the short term, and that would support those who are currently being affected as a result of the downturn. But also the other issue around why exploration activity and stimulation of exploration activity is important is because it allows for the industry to be in a position to be able to hit the ground running when price recovers, rather than to have to then undertake that exploration activity to then reap the yield uh, that, that comes from it. Explora exploration tax credits in Norway in the mid-2000s proved to be a significant success, led to some substantial discoveries, and at the point at which the oil price recovered in the mid-2000s, uh, mid to late 2000s, Norway was in a position to capitalise upon that uh, uh, very early. I believe that the same opportunities can be realised for the oil and gas industry were those tax credits to be put in place. I think it's a plea that the industry should be making, and many in the industry are making, many experts are making, and I believe the Scottish Government is making. I think we should unite to make those pleas to the Chancellor for the budget that those changes can be effected. <coughs>